I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking about acupuncture and how those modalities can help with diminished ovarian reserve. Even if you don't have diminished ovarian reserve, this episode is really a deep dive into acupuncture. It's got a lot of benefits for fertility and your health in general. So excited for you to listen to this episode. Take care. Hey there, excited to offer you a special promo code for February. Hang tight for that. So I'd like to invite you and your partner to a supercharge your fertility discovery call. This call is for you if you meet at least one of these criteria. You've been trying to get pregnant for at least two years. You've been through at least one failed IUI or IVF. This call is for action takers. If you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, fabfertile.com and click on apply here. That's fabfertile.com and click on apply here. And as of today, you will use promo code February, 2022 to waive the application fee. That's promo code February, 2022 to waive the application fee. The promo code will end on Sunday, February the 27th. So make sure you take advantage of this. Space is very limited. Spots will fill up quickly. Use promo code February 2022 when you go to fabfertile.com and click on apply here. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. There's a lot of information about which supplements are right for fertility. And like most couples I speak with, you are probably taking a lot of supplements. But are these supplements optimizing or harming your fertility? That's why we recommend professional grade supplements without harmful dyes, fillers, or top allergens so that you can prepare your body in the best way for pregnancy. And as you may know, we take a functional approach to fertility. And while supplements are included in your customized protocols, which are based on testing, they are only part of the equation because there's no pill you can take that will out supplement the basics, such as poor diet, dysregulated sleep, either moving too much or not enough and not dealing with chronic stress. So we do recommend basic supplements for both men and women. And these are essential starters that you need to have right now to optimize your preconception health. And I'm excited to offer you a special discount at our Fab Fertile store. You'll receive 15% discount on our professional grade supplements. So simply go to Fab Fertile store, that's F-A-B Fertile store.com to access the basic supplements so that you can prepare your body for pregnancy success without wasting time and money on supplements that may not be right for you. Go to Fab Fertile Store, that's fabfertilestore.com and save 15% on your order. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast. And I've got a favor to ask you, if you are enjoying learning about the functional approach to fertility, consider going to iTunes and rating and reviewing the podcast. This is how it helps the show reach more people that are struggling with infertility, knowing that there's another approach that really can get to the bottom of why it's not working in the first place. So all you need to do is if you're on the app or the desktop, just go in and consider leaving a five-star rating and leave a review. And there is step-by-step instructions in the show notes showing you exactly how to do that. So if you can just take a few minutes right now, you can pause this recording, come back, leave the review. It would really mean the world to me and help others that are on the fertility journey as well. I didn't need to go to donor eggs. Obviously, Mm -hmm. I don't regret it. I have beautiful children. I could have done things differently, restored. I was still cycling back in my in my 20s. I could have looked at my health, the environmental toxins, the stress I was under. Many, many women are being told their eggs are too old. That's often merely an assumption that's not based on actual evidence. The reason being that there is no direct test of egg quality. You can't test egg quality. It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or he has a zinc deficiency. Like there can be a root cause to these symptoms that are, you know, quote unquote, period problems that the doctor will pass you a pill without any question of why. And some part of you knows that if you can reframe your journey from not one of struggle, or if it is struggle, learn how to embrace the struggle. Learn how to embrace it. Most conditions in the child occur during the nine months of development. It's the the genetic switches are turned on or turned off and they're pre-programmed. So you are in such a powerful, amazing position to do amazing things for your kids. You know, why is IVF the first step? Because we believe it should be the last step. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby.
Hey there, I'm Sarah Clark, founder of Fab Fertile and your host. I believe the functional approach is the first step for anyone struggling with infertility, and my aim is to help you get pregnant naturally. Today, I'm welcoming Dr. Susan Fox to the podcast, and we're digging into how acupuncture can help improve diminished ovarian reserve. Dr. Susan Fox is committed to supporting you and experiencing optimum health and well-being. She combines traditional Chinese medicine with functional medicine, and she offers an integrative approach that is based on your unique diagnosis. She works in collaboration with your healthcare team and she provides information education to achieve your transformation. She has got 20 years experience as a doctor of acupuncture and Chinese medicine and a fellow of the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine. And she's also trained in functional medicine. So thanks so much for listening. I'm so thankful that you're here. Make sure you hit subscribe. And if you know someone else who is on the fertility journey, please share this podcast with them. Hey, Dr. Susan, excited to have you on the podcast. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for including me. Awesome. So if you could share with our listeners really how you came to do this work. Certainly. Well, unlike many in my field who seem to have approached it from more of a Chiron wounded healer, they've been through some version of the experience themselves. That wasn't so much the case for me. Mine was more of a matter of either serendipity or grace, however you choose to interpret it, I kind of interpret it as grace in that when I finished my education and got my license, I decided I was going to go and commemorate this change and get myself a little tchotchke to sort of say, I'm no longer a student. I'm now a provider. And when I walked into the healing arts place, it was almost like a magnetic draw down the aisle toward the Tonkas and in front of Green Tara, who I did not even know at the time was the goddess of compassion healing. And I could feel myself get emotional at that time and ask the monk, who is the owner, what's happening to me? And he explained that this was the goddess of compassionate healing. So my small tchotchke turned out to be a rather large tanka, who was kind of the impression of my practice for the first maybe 12 years. At that time, I purchased it, I loaded her up in my car, and once again, like a magnetic pull was drawn toward a particular office space where I had never been before, and lo and behold, an empty spot, and I thought, well, that must be my place, and across the hall from which was, and here's your answer, a reproductive endocrinologist's office. And so I kind of said, I guess I'm your new neighbor, and through that relationship, a lot of his patients were coming to be asking for some help because back in that day, the science was just coming out that acupuncture, in fact, was proven to be beneficial toward successful IVF transfers. So I quickly learned that I had a lot to learn and rolled up my sleeves and continued education and got added certifications and ultimately my fellowship at the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine and my doctorate in the field so that I could really be sure I was providing patients with current and quality care to support their fertility endeavors, whether it was trying to conceive naturally or through advanced reproductive therapies. I love that. Yeah, really just yeah, thank uh, you. Yeah, guided and led to it. Beautiful. Truly, truly. Yes. yes. So today we're going to be focusing on diminished ovarian reserve and really acupuncture and Chinese medicine and kind of these diagnoses, because probably similar to you and ourselves, even though someone comes in with this diagnosis, we don't focus on the diagnosis. We look at the whole person, the whole body, like from a mind, body, spirit approach. So if someone is dealing with diminished ovarian reserve, that's where we're going to focus. First of all, so let's talk about how would acupuncture help with that? You know, obviously there are studies talking about pre and post transfer, how helpful it can be. So what are you seeing, I guess, clinically with DOR and acupuncture? Well, likewise, the diagnoses are useful for having a place from which to begin our investigation, but diminished ovarian reserve is oftentimes a scary diagnosis for a woman to be given. And really where our concern is not with so much, what are the numbers, how many follicles are they counting, but what is the quality of those follicles? So when a woman says, you know, her diagnosis has been diminished ovarian reserve. And I think the latest nomenclature is premature ovarian insufficiency, which sounds a little gentler, but still a bit of a knockout punch. I just immediately begin to tell her that we're not so much concerned with how many follicles are being seen. We're concerned with the 
quality of the follicles that they are seeing and what they might not be seeing because the ovarian reserve is determining how far along in her reproductive health she has come. And as we know, with any reproductive health, it can be mitigated, reversed, and one can almost get younger over time. That's the magic of epigenetics. We're not fixed in our DNA. So we use acupuncture as part of our whole system's traditional Chinese medicine to say, how can we improve the blood flow to these ovaries? I will oftentimes use microcurrent as part of my acupuncture treatment for the follicles to really help drive blood flow to those ovaries. So the follicles therein can get nutrient rich blood. And I'll talk to this woman about, you know, what is the quality of the blood that we're delivering? How is her nutrition, hydration, her own circulation and her own restoration through sleep? I consider those the four pillars of our health, including our reproductive health. And I'll jokingly say sometimes, you know, I can either drive Twinkie rich blood, or I can drive nutrient rich blood to her ovaries. And so I think that that really helps empower her to realize that she is an active part of the team, that nothing's really being done to her, it's being done with her, so that she is really an integral part of the process. And that this is not only for the health of her ovaries and this cycle, but this is for her whole health, her whole reproductive health from now through post menopause because what we do now is gonna affect whether switches are flipped on or stay turned off in the genetic markers. Yeah, and there's a lot of hope in that, right, too, because I think sometimes people, it's like, wait a minute, this is what I've been told. It's fairly grim. You know, I was diagnosed with premature ovarian insufficiency at 28. I had both Mm -hmm. my kids with donor eggs, and Mm -hmm. that's why I focused my business with helping couples with these diagnoses, because I know I had all these underlying health issues, food sensitivities, gut infections, and really like chronic stress, which I actually would have said I wasn't stressed during the time, but looking back, I know that I was. And so with the egg quality, let's kind of talk about that as far as how that can help. And we can talk about some specific points and things that you're using for that. Yes. Here again, as you just said, you know, stress is a huge component of it. We get rather flippant with the word stress saying, oh, I had a stressful day, but we don't really pay attention to, nor do we necessarily even know what does that mean physiologically until we start thinking about that fight or flight syndrome where blood is flowing only to the large muscles that can either fight or flee and it's being deflected away from muscles and organs that are really used for our detoxification and our reproduction. So if we can kind of help train ourselves to mitigate that tendency because we do get into almost a habit of waking up in a sympathetic response and just powering through our day as though we are fighting that saber toothed tiger from, I was going to say nine to five, but we now know it's more like seven to nine. There's very little time for the deep breathing that we need, sort of the slow intake of nutrition that we need for ensuring, did we in fact get hydration in for the day? Do we need some electrolyte support to make sure that our cells are getting nourished? Because really at the end of the day, every cell in our body is kind of a reflection of how have we approached the stressful aspects of our day? Yeah, I just actually recorded a podcast this morning all about hydration. So Dr. Dana Cohen, who is the author of Quench and just talking about like for me for years, chronically dehydrated, like I literally was like, I don't have time to pee. I I thought I I needed to pee faster. It was like, it was a ridiculous thing now. As I sit here, I have two glasses of one is like a little beverage. I make up another one's a glass of water. And I just know if I haven't had the water, I just feel off. Whereas before I had no idea that I was chronically dehydrated for years. Right. Either the small muscle tensions or Mm. aches or the slight headache, or as you say, if if you haven't had to pee all day long, you're probably dehydrated. That's a a good sign to be sure. (laughs) And I really have found that, you know, here again, epigenetics, our environment is requiring so much of us that I really find that using electrolyte support, and this might be part of what that podcast included, is really critical to really let that water get into the cell, flush out the cell, hydrate the cell wall so that it can then take in the nutrients with the next, what is the term, the barrier crossover of nutrients getting back in. 
Yeah, Dr. Dana on the podcast talked about her favorite electrolyte powder, which is now escaping me, but you can listen to that podcast and she sure. can talk about yeah. that uh, for the listeners. And then do you have one that you uh, prefer, Susan? Well, I tend to use the Designs for Health brand. I can rely on them for their quality. They do third-party testing. So for many of the products that I use, I will use Designs for Health. And then I have for other products, you know, my own preferences based upon what are the raw materials used. Like for instance, for CoQ10, I tend to prefer the integrative therapeutics line Mm -hmm. because they use for their raw materials, a particular form of CoQ10 powder that is derived from Japanese sources that have been demonstrated to be the most efficacious in improving ATP output for the cellular activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're the same. Whatever is the best one on the market right now. Exactly. Yeah, we use full script. So it's sort of... Yeah, exactly. Thank goodness for full script. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We can pick and choose the best. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so the specific points for this, maybe we can just kind of do a little overview of that and kind of when someone comes to see you, what they're experiencing. Absolutely. I will use different points at different times in the cycle. Mm -hmm. So in the follicular phase, I'm using points that will open what we call the conception vessel, the REN meridian. And then I will use points depending upon whether or not she's finished with her menstrual flow. I'll use points with or without microcurrent that are specifically for the ovaries and then for the uterus. And if she's finished with her menstrual flow, if it's cycle day, you know, seven or eight, I'll add microcurrent to kind of mimic the arterial pulse and getting that blood flow driven to her ovaries. If she's bleeding still, I don't use that because I don't want blood flow to go in reverse. I don't want to relax blood vessels such that menstrual flow goes back through the tubes and into the peritoneal cavity. And then I'll use points, and I don't know how specific you want me to get in the acupuncture points, but I'll use points to enrich blood. I use the meridian names and numbers. I'll right. use spleen eight and liver eight. I'll use spleen six. And sometimes I'll use, depending upon here again for the diminished ovarian reserve person, I will use a combination of points, kidney six and kidney 27 to open up the full kidney meridian and really get that as balanced and supercharged as possible. Then I would say in the second half of the cycle, if there's a, an attempt to conceive, I'll start always with the do 20, you know, the point at the top of the head. And then I will use to help sort of drive the movement of chi. By the way, I do not do that second half of the cycle until six to eight days post ovulation, mm-hmm. because I want to make sure that an embryo, if conception has occurred, has a chance to leave the tubes and make its way into the uterus before we start our encouragement for its lifting and tucking in. Then I will start with do 20 and I'll use points that are contraindicated when pregnant, but are really great for moving the chi so soon after the embryo tucks in. And that would be a large intestine four and liver three. I will use kidney three again to support the kidneys. I will sometimes circle the umbilicus so I don't go down as far as the ovaries and uterus, but I'll just go down to like REN6, stomach 25, REN12 in order to just help drive blood flow from the stomach through to the internal cavities. So basically when you're doing this, a lot of them are going to be on the abdomen then? Many are on the abdomen. Yes. Some are on the arms and legs as well, but most are on the torso And then I would say probably a medial portion of the lower legs. The legs, okay. Yeah. And then that one, they always do that one. Is it the one between the eyes? That one you're saying? Well, the yin tong is interesting. I always will use an eye pillow to get acupressure Mm -hmm. to yin tong, the point between the eyes. I find that it's almost like a 50-50 chance I could actually create a bit of a headache or excess energy in that point location. Because here again, the patients who are coming to me, they're rather stressed. They're kind of up in their head. They don't need necessarily extra energy coming to their head. Whereas the, just the gentle pressure of the eye pillow, either on their eyebrows or eyeballs provides the stimulation to that point that I need. And what if there's blood comes on some, because it's funny when they do the one in between my eyes, it, it bleeds and it freaking hurts every time they do it. What does that yeah, mean? Between you and me, it means don't do it. <laughs> That's what I thought. I'm like, ow. Yeah. Between you and me, I would, I would say that, you know, you would be a candidate in my mind for using an acupressure as opposed to acupuncture 
I mean, the point is so surface to the skin that it doesn't necessarily need puncture in order to be stimulated. I'm glad you said ow, because my request to any patient is if, if the response is ow, That is your body telling me to get that needle out and either try again or go to another location because we don't need to suffer through an owl. I mean, sometimes we get a wow, that's a lot of energy, especially in our, you know, stomach 36 points where, you know, we're trying to call up a lot of immune support and just the location of that point is, you know, down at the calf can be a strong energy release, but I don't think we ever need to get an owl response especially working with fertility, because we're working typically with deficiency situations, not excess situations, such as a sprain or strain, where you might need to let out some extra energy, where our goal is usually to build up the energy. I know sometimes they've come in and they've moved them around a little bit. And I was like, oh, I feel (laughs) that. Is that how it should be? Of course. Yeah. That's the wow that I'm trying to describe. Yeah. So I'll come in midway to a treatment Mm -hmm. and kind of just give a little manipulation to the needles just to make sure I'm having to kind of direct the median lights, if you will, of the energy flow so that we are keeping the chi flowing because sometimes a patient will go into a deep state of rest, which is great. And I want to make sure that during that rest, we're still getting the benefits of the acupuncture treatment where the energy is moving and not necessarily settling down for a sleep. <laughs> yeah. And can you talk about the microcurrent, what exactly that is? Sure. Microcurrent is electrical stimulation on the needles And I usually use it just to the point of perception here again, when working with fertility, I don't want to be hyper stimulating anything. I really want to be mimicking arterial pulse. So this regular rhythmic tapping sensation that occurs when the needles are attached to the microcurrent and I'm slowly turning that microcurrent up, it provides almost like a bit of a restful response to the nervous system. And it does provide that sort of regular rhythmic pulsation to the points that I have applied those electrodes to the needles, where it really does drive more blood flow to that location. So in most cases, I'm using it in fertility, either at the lower abdomen or the lower back, where I really want to drive more blood flow to the organs of the ovaries and uterus so that they are in a better position to attend to the signals that they're going to get from the pituitary to either stimulate follicles or stimulate ovulation and so forth. And is this a half hour treatment or how long is this? My treatments are a little bit longer. I use a 50 minute hour. So I do about a 10 minute check-in. If we need longer, we'll schedule a longer time frame. but a 10 minute check-in usually is following along my already predetermined at the point of first visit, what is our diagnosis and treatment plan, and then a 40-minute acupuncture treatment. So I come in at about 20 minutes and make adjustments accordingly. Sometimes it's doing a front and back treatment. Sometimes I'm moving that person around. Other times I'm keeping her on her back or front and just you know coming in at that 20-minute mark and stimulating the needles. Sometimes that means raising the microcurrent because she will have adapted to that regular rhythmic pulsation such that she's not feeling it anymore. And then I'll raise it to the point of perception again, so that we know that it's doing its job. And would you do any on the ear? I will sometimes do it on the ear. My patients tend not to like ear acupuncture. So for the ears, I tend to use ear seeds. Mm -hmm. Here again, the points are so surface to the skin that I can get the stimulation needed without needling in the ear. So most of the time I'll do ear treatments, either post transfer, where I want to get the organ stimulated, but I want to stay away from the actual lower abdomen, but I can get to any point on the body. As you know, I could get to the diaphragm. I could get to the uterus. I could get to the brain to help sedate the nervous system a bit using ear seeds. I know after I have acupuncture, I'm like, oh, I just feel very, I'm totally in that parasympathetic. I feel super yes. zen, really yes. good. I um, like to call yeah. that acuphoria. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that a great wow. name? It's been, it's been a while. I, I've yeah. been like probably six months since I'm gone. So is it you should, or is that kind of normal to feel that? Like what do people oh, feel yeah. afterwards? That's a very normal feeling to feel immediately afterwards. And I will always make sure that somebody sort of feels back in their body before they leave the office mm-hmm. so that they are not turning on heavy machinery when they're in that state. And we have waters and maybe protein bars set aside in case their blood sugars may have dropped because here again, you're having a 
significant parasympathetic rest and digest and detoxify and eliminate activity while you're on the table. And if someone comes in without having eaten for a while, she may have a bit of a drop in her blood sugar. So I want to make sure she's had you know, a couple of bites of a protein bar to give her body some fuel before she turns that ignition back on. And is there any recommendations then for the evening or like for things to do? My recommendation is always to listen to your body because you may finish an acupuncture treatment feeling exhausted, which means you are, or energized, which means your energy was good and it truly has stimulated the activity of your sympathetic as well as parasympathetic. So you're actually able to go for that exercise class or run. Acupuncture is more revelatory in its desire and work to balance the body. So it's more a matter of paying attention to how do you feel? What is your body telling you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As far as the qualifications to look, because there's a lot of other different practitioners that are adding acupuncture into their practice and for fertility, it's very specific. So where do we find qualified practitioners? What are we looking for? That's a very good question. And it's so important because of course we wouldn't go to a generalist if we needed to have oncology care. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't go to a cardiologist if we need gynecology care. So we really do want to find someone who is trained and has proven his or her training. I find the easiest resource for me is a group of which I'm a fellow. It's called the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine, aborm.org. It's an actually, while it says American Board, it's an international group of acupuncturists who have demonstrated through rigorous testing that they can understand and translate and work on behalf of a patient, whether she or he, but mostly she, is going through advanced reproductive therapies like IUI or IVF, or whether trying to conceive without naturally. So that is one slam dunk resource that I will rely on. And that said, it would be inaccurate for me to say that's the sole resource, right? Because there are many people who have demonstrated their ability to do this work really well and are not members of this. So I would say, if you want to look outside of something as sort of credentialed as aborm.org, look to the person's resume and how long have they been in practice what are their credentials? You know, have they done anything beyond their grad school that shows sort of an added study in reproductive endocrinology or gynecology that would indicate that they indeed have the specialty? There's so many. A lot of people do, right. A lot of people say I specialize in fertility as though claiming to do so is the very thing. But of course you, you want some evidence. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. How long does that go for months or like, how do, how do we, like, I mean, it could go for months. There is no downside. My typical recommendation, if I don't see a need to really get this person into a reproductive endocrinologist support, mm -hmm. then I will say, let's try for two or three months and see how we do. Because in my experience and opinion, what we're doing in that, you know, two or three months is very helpful to a success in that three to four month time frame, should they need to go on to advanced reproductive therapies with the Western medical doctor, because we are supporting the follicle health and growth, not only of the cycle we are in, but the three future cycles we are going toward because follicular genesis is a 90 to 120 day event. And then really in conjunction, doing those diet and lifestyle changes as well. Without with a doubt. Right. It is, it is a fact. There is no one thing in my experience or opinion that is going to be the magic button right. that's going to get the job done. It really does boil down to taking care of ourselves, literally babying ourselves, you know, making sure we are fed and hydrated yep. and rested mm -hmm. and getting a little movement where at the end of the day, carbon beings. We need to take care of these bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for diminished ovarian reserve and low AMH and high FSH, does it need to be a little more personalized then? No. Well, I mean, I will personalize it not so much for DOR. If for instance, someone had PCOS or something like that, I might add a point that is about what we call in Chinese medicine, clearing damp, because those accumulated follicles that are actually not cysts, but they call them PCOS, are what we would consider a damp accumulation. So I might be adding points that would help clear that dampness, such as a spleen nine or spleen six. Mm -hmm. 
And then as far as your diet and lifestyle recommendations. Yes. It's not that much different from diet and lifestyle recommendations, period. But I would say three meals, try to get your three meals a day. I'm an advocate of a gluten-free diet for everybody because we know that is an inflammatory food group, if we even want to call it a food group (laughs) for most people. And I try to make it as simple as possible because I think that, you know, by the time they're in this diagnosis and this treatment plan and whether they're going naturally or going with advanced reproductive therapies, they're overwhelmed. So I pretty much say visualize your plate. If every food was deconstructed on your plate, half of that plate would be vegetables of the widest variety of color and flavor and texture so that each of those vegetables can provide your microbiome, which is the source of all of our central conductor, if you will, our symphony Mm -hmm. conductor with the fuel, the butyrates it needs in order to do its jobs and sending out the signals to hormones to have this function and neurotransmitters to have that function and so forth. And then a quarter of the plate would be lean protein. And then an eighth would be your healthy fat. And an eighth would be your starchy carb of the non-gluten variety, the sweet potato. I'm fine with white potato. I do recommend if people want to have lots of white potato that they cook and cool, and then recook or reuse the potato after it's been cooled. So it becomes a resistant starch because I want to reduce sugar spikes because that will be inflammatory. My whole goal is to keep the body as uninflamed as possible. So that's the nutrition component. And it includes hydration, of course, as we've discussed. I advise try to get three liters in a day if you can. And when people feel like they might be getting three liters, but they're not quite sure, I'll say, well, fill up three liter bottles <laughs> and use that as your visual cue and maybe put a little bit of electrolyte into each of those bottles. So if you don't get through all three, if you've gotten through two, you've sort of increased the value of the two you've taken in by the electrolytes. Mm-hmm. Agree. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, here again, circulation, moderate movement depending upon the diagnosis. So for a PCOS person, I'll have a different recommendation than a DOR person. For a DOR person, I would be saying, let's have you just take a hike in nature, do some yoga, get your heart rate up. So you're getting a little bit of a sheen on your body when you're exercising, but it's not about exhausting yourself at the end of your workout. I want you to feel more energized than depleted for the work you've done. What are the common themes you're seeing with DOR? Like we see a lot of people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity where gluten's off the chart and, you know, like type A's, triple, like all these extra hours and things like that overworking or researching. But yeah, what, like, what are you seeing? I think it's probably more indicative of my physical geography demographic, you know, lots of professional women trying to manage it all and also trying to do all the right things, but trying to do all the right things becomes a stress in and of itself Mm -hmm. so that they're trying to do their high intensity interval training and their soul cycling and their pelotoning. Then they're rushing to get the kids from their activities one to another. And then the food needs to be on the table, but everybody wants something different. Mm -hmm. So it's that level of stress. So they tend to be more of the lean, depleted woman and dehydrated. You can almost see it in their skin tone, that their skin tone is a little bit more dry or sallow. They're not as moist. Their hair is a little bit drier. So we could then go in, you know, say, okay, let's analyze your hormones. You know, how's your thyroid and all of that? Is there autoimmune that we can see? But sometimes we don't have to go that far. We just have to take a look and listen and then respond accordingly because they know they're driving themselves into depletion. And so, and when we can just say, okay, what can you take out? What if you don't do Peloton three times a week and high intensity interval training or soul cycling three times a week? What if two of those days a week, you took a walk (laughs) or did some yoga or something that wasn't about checking off the, I don't know how to describe that type A accomplishment of exercise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything else you want to say there on diet and lifestyle? And anything else? That's well, restoration, right? We need sleep. I mean, sleep is now the current, I think, primary prescription for everybody. And certainly we've all been through at minimal, a very stressful year globally. And I think our circadian rhythms have gotten a little bit wonky because we're not following schedules as we once did. Now we're trying to get back into schedules without mm-hmm. our bodies being on the same schedule. So I am a... It electronics off by 
eight thirty or nine. Dim the lights in your household as the light is dimming outside. So our own pineal gland can produce melatonin, which is our sleep hormone, but also our antioxidant hormone from our pineal gland. Make sure that your phone, if your phone is your alarm, get it on either airplane mode or Wi-Fi off, all of that kind of thing. So our sleep hygiene is pristine. And then in the Chinese medicine clock, we want to be asleep between the hours of 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. because that is when beginning liver time, our organs of detoxification, you know, have a chance to kind of get center stage and do their jobs. And we don't want our bodies to be trying to both digest a late night meal, take in another episode of Handmaid's Tale, you know, whatever, whatever are the things that are stimulating our fight or flight response when our rest and digest response is, should be front and center. Yeah. The handmaid's tale, geez, that dystopian. Nightmare. Right. Right. I mean, that, and there's I so many of that thing. It was so depressing. I, just, and, and no. it was, I mean, it, that I, I should have thrown that out there, but it was just an, as an like example, because know. truthfully, there are more of that type of dystopian or fear mongering shows out there than there are of those that would help us just to sort of settle down. So maybe instead listen to some music that you love. I mean, when was the last time we all just turned on some music that we love? or light a candle or read a book, not a Kindle, or write some poetry or some journaling, things that just even saying it, we can all feel our shoulders drop a little bit and be able to take a deeper breath. What about if you're waking up between two to four? You talk as a lot of people do. Can you talk about that in Chinese medicine? Right. Well, I'm not going to so much, if you don't mind, speak about it so much in Chinese medicine as I am just generally. That is the hour of our adrenals, right? So if we're waking between two, so I could call it kidney yang, but I think I can have a better explanation if I talk about it in forms of the adrenals. If we're waking between two and four, we either are having a blood sugar drop because we've either eaten or had wine too late in the evening or something, and we had a sugar spike, then a sugar drop, and our adrenals are trying to kick out some cortisol saying, go find some blood sugar stores in this body because it can't get too low. And we've been adrenalized for days or weeks or months or years. And so from that same gland, we'll uh, we'll spurt some adrenaline and then pop, our eyes are wide open. And we're trying to think about some problem to resolve instead of getting a good night's sleep. So we want to back up to the bedtime hour. If we are running high on cortisol, if we are living a stressful life, there are adaptogen herbs that are really great for clearing cortisol and getting that cortisol level to where it's supposed to be at eight or 9 PM because it will naturally rise while we're sleeping and fasting, but we just don't want it to be rising and falling and rising and falling, nor do we want it to be peaking beyond what is needed for just keeping blood sugar stable during our sleep. So if that is happening, I recommend a two part strategy of adding some magnesium at bedtime. And I typically like to use magnesium glycinate Mm -hmm. Because often that person here again is a little dehydrated. And so her muscles are a little twitchy. And then I like to add a formula called cortisol manager also by integrative therapeutics, which is at full script. It's a lovely blend, a really lovely blend of adaptogen herbs that both clear cortisol and support the adrenals for their health. Awesome. Yeah. I like that. And so is there anything you are personally obsessed with right now, be it a book, a website, an app, a documentary, anything you're just, you just love and want to share? Well, I mm, personally obsessed with, I would say, no, there's nothing I'm personally obsessed with. I am really rolling up my sleeves and trying to build some online courses myself. So I'm learning, maybe I'm personally obsessed with learning all there is to learn in this field. We're trying to manage podcasting and Instagram and how to create click funnels, whatever these things are, there's a whole language that I'm learning (laughs) and it's fun. It's fun. And yet it feels as though I'm in kindergarten all over again. So it's what I've been obsessed with, if that is the right term, but I don't know if necessarily what the what the listeners care to hear. No, it's okay. Yeah, no, <laughs> and, it's good. To- and maybe they're already doing it and they're thinking, what's the big deal, lady? <laughs> <laughs> and is there a success story you wanted to share with us? Anything that's coming to mind, maybe instantly around DOR? I'm sure you've got lots. I do have lots. I do have lots. And it's funny. I also have this, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's a deep, heartfelt 
imperative that I not own someone else's success story or claim someone else's success story Mm -hmm. any more than I own or claim someone else's. Well, I still call it a success story if they've come to a conclusion that the way they thought they were going to have a family is not going to unfold for them because I consider them successful in their life as well. There's nothing more sort of honoring in my mind as, again, embracing an outcome. You know, I kind of liken it to our desire to never want to exhale for fear that we might not ever get an inhale because we know one day we won't get an inhale. I mean, that's just life. But if we don't exhale, then we're not going to get the next inhale for 99.999% of our life. This might sound silly, but along those lines, I have several lovely stories that are not mine. They belong to the women and couples who forge their path with my help, perhaps. And I don't want to sound like I'm being too magnanimous here, but it truly is an imperative. I have never been, nor will I ever be one who puts up the baby pictures on my wall because it just, I love all of these women and couples and their children are beautiful, but they're not mine. So yeah, I love that actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's honorable, but really, as you say, it's your seeing yourself more as the guide. Is that kind of how you see yourself? Exactly. I'm the guide. I, you know, I'm sharing the resources that I can and speaking of resources. And maybe this is what you're asking. If there's something I'm obsessed with, I do have resources that I can recommend to your listeners. If they might be looking for some additional support, may I share those? Sure. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. There are a few books and colleagues and teachers who I really admire, who I think have put out perspectives and support structures that are not necessarily the eat this, get that, do this, get that. They fall outside of that realm of what we're trained our lives. If you do this, then you will get that. And the first one that comes to mind is my teacher and friend. Her name is Dr. Randine Lewis. And the book is called The Way of the Fertile Soul, the way meaning the Tao of the Fertile Soul. And she probably published this book. mm, It's got to be a good 15 years ago or so but it is one of those that is forever current. She's taken the Tao of the Chinese medicine model and put the reader through sort of an inquiry into the five emotions that are attached with our five organ systems. And it really helps to kind of identify where in our emotional life and well-being might we seek more balance so as to help support our overall balance and harmony so as to possibly support our desired outcome. I love Dr. Randy Lewis. Yeah, I do as well. And then the second book I have in mind is by one of your neighbors. Her name is Mary Wong. And she wrote a book about her own story called Pathways to Pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And she's very vulnerable and authentic in her sharing of her tale. And I think in so doing, it really invites the reader to sort of open up the cracks in her own heart, where we try to, you know, kind of just keep our our shields up so that we don't break this field because we feel that we might break down entirely otherwise. And the third is another colleague. Her name is Denise Wiesner. She's in the L area and her book is called Conceiving with Love. Yeah, she was on the podcast too. Oh, was she? Oh, then you know, isn't she lovely? So yeah, I really, I love her book because I love how it really encourages the reader to not forget about her love relationship in the desire to pursue family. And she does it in such an open hearted and sexy way Mm -hmm, that I, that, yeah, that I think it really is again, so healing for a part of us uh, sometimes gets put on the back burner. You know, we say, Oh, we'll pick that up again. Once the baby is born, but relationship isn't about picking that up again. It's about feeding that soil, whatever that soil might be, including the soil of our love relationships. Yeah. For the listeners, they can check out that episode. It was, we talked all about intimacy. So yeah, it's really, it's a really great one. Excellent. Great. And so they can reach out to you uh, via email at Susan at Dr. Dr. Susan Fox.com. So Susan at Dr. Susan Fox.com. And what can they expect with the email? And yeah. Well, I would say if they would put in the subject line, Sarah Clark and Fab Fertile, then that will provoke for me sort of a recognition that it is a call related to this reporting. And they can ask whatever they want to ask. If there's something that I've spoken about, if there's something that I haven't spoken about, I'm happy to share my thoughts and my resources with them. Beautiful. And where else can they find you? The website is drsusanfox.com. 
that's going to share kind of what I do and how I do it and some of the resources that I just mentioned. And yeah. Amazing. And so any final thoughts on this, Dr. Susan? No, thank you. This has been so much fun. I really have enjoyed speaking with you and I hope that it's been able to be of use to you and your listeners. Looking forward to listening to more of your recordings of your podcasts. That was great. Well, thanks for coming on and sharing your words of wisdom with us. Thank you very much, Sarah. Hey there, excited to offer you a special promo code for February. Hang tight for that. So I'd like to invite you and your partner to a supercharge your fertility discovery call. This call is for you if you meet at least one of these criteria. You've been trying to get pregnant for at least two years. You've been through at least one failed IUI or IVF. This call is for action takers. If you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, fabfertile.com and click on apply here. That's fabfertile.com and click on apply here. And as of today, you will use promo code February, 2022 to waive the application fee. That's promo code February, 2022 to waive the application fee. The promo code will end on Sunday, February the 27th. So make sure you take advantage of this. Space is very limited. Spots will fill up quickly. Use promo code February 2022 when you go to fabfertile.com and click on apply here. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. You may be taking supplements that instead of optimizing your fertility, may be harming it. That's why we recommend professional grade supplements without harmful dyes, fillers, or top allergens. Simply go to Fab Fertile Store, that's F-A-B Fertile Store dot com to receive a 15% discount on our basic supplement recommendations for preconception health. That's fabfertilestore.com. The Get Pregnant Naturally podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.